On this episode of Delivering Marketing Joy, we talk with Bobby Lehu about content creation and storytelling and how to do it better. Well, hey there, and welcome to another edition of Delivering Marketing Joy. I'm your host, Kirby Hossman, and with me today is an industry rock star, a guy I really look up to. He's the Chief Content Officer at Common Skew. His name is Bobby Lehu, and I really appreciate you being here, Bobby. Thanks a lot. Glad, glad to be here, Kirby. Thanks for having me. Thanks, man. And so I want to dig right in. Um, I know you in our industry as sort of a master storyteller. That's how I think of you in the industry. Now, as someone who wants to get better, like I do, What's some advice you can give me on better storytelling? Well, we go th- I have this presentation called Enchanting Secrets of Storytelling. And, and for our industry, so I'll get specific about our particular industry because that's what it's geared toward. Um, there are a few key tips. Number one is and Nike is really famous for their uh, saying about connecting product with authentic customer experiences. So in our industry, typically we make the product the hero of the story. When in actuality, it's the end user and how they are using our product, which is where the magic happens. So like Nike, connect the product with the end user experience, and then you'll have uh, – that's that's just one of the secrets. To do that, we just change the perspective, like I said, tell the story from the customer's perspective and not the product's perspective. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing, I I think sometimes – uh, storytelling on one hand is incredibly difficult. Hollywood doesn't spend billions of dollars on it and, and loses, you know, films bomb all the time. So storytelling on one hand is very difficult. And yet on the one, other hand, it's very simple because we've been telling stories since we were knee high. And when you ask a room full of people, and I just did a webinar, a, a, a workshop this weekend and ask a room full of people, how many are good at telling jokes uh, or how many people would say they're t- terrible at telling jokes? Most of the room will raise their hand and say they're terrible at telling jokes. There's this great video out there uh, where Gi- Jerry Seinfeld walks through how to tell a joke, and it's about a 10 to 15 minute video. He tells the story about this one joke that he's been working on for a year. So the reason why I'm bringing this up is, is you know, William Lee Steepmoon said that having a story to tell differs from the ability to tell it, which differs yet further from the ability to tell it well. Mm-hmm. And I think one of the things that's hard for us to grasp is that it's not spontaneously uh, a spontaneous craft. It's actually something we have to work at. So when you look at the masters, when you look at like Jerry Seinfeld and joke telling, you realize that they have studied the craft, that there is a craft to it. And they, that the more work they put in on the front end, the easier it's going to be and more effective it is going to be at the delivery. So when it comes to storytelling, one key is, and there's this guy named Mark Graham. Do you know who I'm talking about? <laughs> I've heard Graham. of him. I've heard of him. <laughs> yeah, anyway. yeah, he's been around. Um, he, he, basically, he says, um, solve the problem. You know, solve the problem. It's about, our business particularly is about solving the problem, not, the, not, not basically finding the product, but it's about solving the problem. Mm. And so storytelling is transformational. There's typically a primary character going through tr- some transformation of some kind. So if you really want to break down how to write or tell a good story, look for the problem. Um, Vonnegut said, basically, every character should want something, even if it's just to get a glass of water. So once you figure out what the problem is, you can back then into telling the story. Mm, and there's uh, w- one of the other things I think, particularly in our business, when it's, when it's a product-centric business that we forget, case histories have been around for a very long time. Why is storytelling now so exciting and, and something that everyone's talking about? Largely because when you read a case history, mm-hmm. it's almost as if we got our instruction from the scientific medical community. Okay. You know, patient had hideous disease. We have this miraculous treatment. We applied it. They were cured. There's no story there whatsoever. It's, yeah. it's just the facts. So one of the keys and the secrets, I think, in our business is that without emotion, it's just a boring case history. Yeah. So that's one thing I think we can do better is inject emotion, find the emotion. Um, and, and interject that into our stories. No, I love that. And, you know, it's so funny. I think not only in our business, but I was, uh, I follow Casey uh, Neistat, um, who is a kind of a famous blogger. And he's like, every single video I started with was, it was like a beginning, there was a conflict and there was a resolution. And as long as there yeah. was that, then I had a good video. And I yeah. you know it's amazing how much, you know, I lose sight of that. I'm creating a video and what's, you know, what's the conflict? 
And so I, I think that's great advice. So I appreciate yeah, that. Well, one other thing, Kirby, sorry, I could talk about this topic for a long time. Yeah. One other thing is that we have to tell the story in a way that, that you empathize with the primary character or someone in the story. That's why telling about their problem and their resolution is critical. The Robert McKee, the famous screen, script, screenwriter consultant to, to Hollywood, um, said that two people can go see a movie – one of them can walk out and and say it was terrible. The other person can say it was incredible. And the reason is the one that said it was incredible empathize with a character or some characters in the film. Yeah. So a lot of it has to do with emotion and empathy. But you're right. It also about just solving this problem. Yeah. And it, you said something in that one that really leads nicely into my next question, which I think some people are thought of as creative. People think of you as mm -hmm. a creative person. Uh, uh, T. Hamilton comes to mind, right? She's creative. Mm -hmm. But, yeah. I think, but I think some people use it as an excuse, right? Like, I'm not creative, so, you know, I'm not going to be able to do that. Is the natural born creative a myth or is it a real thing? Or I guess, in other words, is it natural or can you, can you learn to be more creative? Oh, absolutely. You can learn. You know, this is a famous saying, but Picasso said it took him five years to paint like Raphael, but it took him a lifetime to paint like a child. Mm. Um, and so we were born with a natural predisposition to express ourselves and we lose that along the way for all kinds of reasons but i know nancy andreas uh, andreason has a great article in the atlantic called the creative brain and she breaks down the creative process and one of the beautiful things about it and this is very similar by the way to rooster geislin has probably one of the greatest books of creativity out there called the C creative process and it's worth the price of admission just for the introduction alone both of them talk about creativity from the standpoint of not an inspirational moment but an iterative process mm -hmm. and so you know, Newton, we forget that before the apple fell from the tree and hit Newton on the head, where we think is, you know, in terms of that inspirational moment, he had 20 years invested in that gravitational theory. And so we we tend to forget that creativity is actually shows up in overalls and it's that really hard work. And it's an iterative process. And it's a false assumption that it's just inspirational. And when that's what people think when they say, I'm not creative, they think that creativity means they should be inspirational. And the fact of the matter is, very few creative artists are that way. And almost all of them will say, as, as one writer said, it's terrific hard gardening to really be creative. And we, we tend to rely less on what many artists actually, many great artists actually rely on, and that's the subconscious process. So there is, to me, one of the secrets of creativity is the incubation process. So when you're working on a project, whether it's a book, Kirby, you launched a business. When you were launching that business, there was not a moment that became the inspirational or decisive moment for your business. There was just this constant iteration going on. And behind the scenes was this very subconscious process where basically was, everything was simmering on the back burner. And you would think moments of inspiration would come. They would, but it's mainly because of that hard work that was going on in the past. I mean, there's, there's so many ways to talk around creativity. But the bottom line is um, embrace permanent beta because you're going to suck at it really bad until you learn to get better and 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 understand that it's a process and not a moment mm. yeah i'll tell you what I, I actually have heard you say that before bobby in one of your sessions and i remember that being really helpful for me to go oh okay so you know it's like talking to a comedian say say something funny like they've yeah. been working really hard on that right. so yeah right. um and i think when i heard you say well creativity that's something that takes time for everyone that was that set me free a little bit yeah. um and so that was helpful so yeah. to, to dig into your role right now you're the chief content officer at common skew so right can you tell me a little bit about that role and how you choose the content you create as a company i'm curious about that yeah sure so um my role as the chief content officer is to help orchestrate and execute content mm -hmm. to help our customers so you know, you and I are big content fans, Kirby. You're one of the most prolific people I know. But good content really is just about helping customers. So whether you're inspiring entrepreneurship or whether you're helping them tactically get through some procedure, some process of some kind, I, if you tie the two together, I think you've got a great win. But really, content is really just about helping customers. And I think particularly, you know, a lot of your audience is distributors. And I think we tend to forget this in our very product-centric world that content really is about just helping your customer achieve their objective. Mm 
And it's all, a lot of it is in the execution, but most of it behind the scenes is about the principle, like what principles drive you. And in your case, and in our case, it's about inspiring entrepreneurship and just helping our customer, whether that's tactically speaking, like a strategy for sales, execution for sales, or whether it's big picture thinking about how to, how to motivate your team, things like that. But it really is just about helping customers. No, that's that's awesome. That is, the, it, and it's a great reminder, right? Because I, you know, with I think everybody has a little bit of an ego. I know I do, uh, in the sense mm-hmm. that you're like, hey, I, I think this will be a cool piece of content. And I think coming back to it and saying, oh, but does it matter to the people it should matter to? Is a is a great right. great point. So you've answered my questions, Bobby. Uh, it wasn't that yeah. painful, right? Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, you know how nervous I am at these things. Yeah, <laughs> you do a great job. I give everybody a chance to ask me a question. Do you have a question for me? I got a few. Okay. I a few. okay. And, and, I, and I hope I'm better at asking them than I was answering. No. So I'm curious about, you know, we talked about storytelling and, and my opinions on it, but yeah. what have you seen in terms of it impacting the content that you produce? Yeah, so a couple of things come to mind. Um, great question, by the way. So um, I think storytelling is a little bit different on an interview show like this, um, probably similar mm-hmm. to the podcast interviews. Um, I like to set the table and ask questions where the guest gets to be the showcase storyteller. Um, and one right. of the, it, what's interesting to me, and I, I'm, my guess is you're kind of similar, I actually spend more time coming up with the questions than I do with doing the show. I really try to dig yeah. into what, right. the, what the person's like, what they're interested in, what, they, um, uh, what they're into, so that I'm asking every single person that comes on the show a different uh, layer of questions to allow them to kind of speak their truth, if that makes any sense. I don't spend yeah. a ton of time of where I'm trying to get them to go, if that makes sense. I, I just want to kind of give them the platform and let them be the, the thing. And then, you know, the lesson for that is then you get the when they're comfortable telling their story, then you get a pretty good piece of content that I think everybody's kind of interested in checking out. Yeah. Um, let me ask you a question about creativity. So you asked me one about storytelling and you asked me one about creativity. You have, um, you produce a lot of content. You're very prolific. So you have the video series, you have the written blog, you've got books, um, you, you, and you, you, you're constantly doing things. You have the podcast, multiple podcasts, right? Not just one podcast. Uh, what have you learned about the creative process and how does that impact your work? You know what? Um, actually I, like I told you, I wasn't blowing smoke. It helped me understand or helped kind of free me up when you and other people have said, look, you don't have to be creative on the spot. It's great when that magic happens. Yeah. But what I've found is the reason that, you know, use the word prolific and thank you the reason I create a lot of content is that I find that the more I create, the, the more reps I get, the better I get at it. Um, and yeah, uh, right. for me, that's been a big piece. And what I like is each of like the blog is different than the podcast I do by myself. And the podcast yeah. I do by myself is totally different than the one I do with Petrie, Mr. Mr. Bill. And then, yeah. you know, this piece is sort of the foundational. So like each one's a little different and allows me to, to use different creative juices in, in each one. And so, um, yeah. as for lessons, you know, I, my big lesson is don't overthink it. Um, I think that so many times yeah. you're paralyzed by what's going to happen when I put it out there. And I am the perfect example of, I just put a lot out there and some of it is okay. And some of it's disastrous, <laughs> but no, no one's ever died. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? So <laughs> just, just, just believe in yourself and put something out there. You know, what's funny about that is um, Dave Van Ronk was uh, the – back in the Green, Greenwich Village days when Bob Dylan was was coming, you know, his, a rising star, first a rising star. He was hanging out in the Greenwich, Greenwich Village scene, and there was a guy named Dave Van Ronk who was basically one of the greatest folk singers that's ever lived. And Van Ronk famously said about Dylan that Dylan wrote a lot. And then he said some of it was good. Some of it was very good. So the inference, of course, being that Dylan was very prolific. Yeah. And so I, I think that's that's completely true. And it's funny you mentioned about execution. You uh, you still get nervous when you're about to hit the publish button, or have you pretty much worked all that out? I think that the, it, there's there are places where I get nervous. Like, right. um, But for the most part, I've fallen into a rhythm. I actually – here, 
You ever hear of the person that gets uncomfortable when they haven't worked out because they work out every day? Yeah, right. Today is a great example. I woke up early this morning to do a podcast because there was due, one due today and it wasn't done yet. Um, so I was actually more uncomfortable with the idea that there wasn't going to be one when I said there was. Uh, so does that make sense? So I was, it was it more, more, more important to me to get it out there than yeah. it was that it has to be perfect. So that, I mean, that's just me. Well, yeah, that's really good. And you know, before we went live, you and I were talking about this, that I, I'm incredibly nervous doing things like this, particularly, right? Just, just driving me. I mean, I really neurotic mess when I have to do something like video and, and, uh, and yet I know that it's going to be better for me in the long run. And I know that's been the case with your career. Yeah. You know, you've basically seen you come on the scene and just sort of explode. It looks like it's instantaneous, but instantaneous, instantaneous, but it's not, it's been this iterative process. So, uh, last question. Okay. You have the videos, you have podcasts, you write, what brings you joy? What do you enjoy doing the most? You know, uh, by the way, Kirby, let me interject this. Yeah. You also have, the brewery. We also run a distributorship. Uh, but in terms of maybe we can focus on content. But in terms of content, what do you enjoy doing the most? Yeah. So, I, I from a consistency perspective, I mean, I really um, enjoy doing the unscripted podcast with Bill. We just we like it sounds like we have fun yeah. because we do have fun. Um, yeah, so cool. that that's really cool. But honestly, the DMJ delivery marketing joy for me is where it sort of all started. And it started as a piece where I thought, oh, this would be a cool piece of content and shared platform. And if I do an interview with Bobby, he shares it. We all, you know, everybody wins. But what I found is it's a masterclass every week um, yeah. for me. Yeah. And I get to learn so much from really smart people. And so I really genuinely do enjoy this too. Yeah, that's cool, man. That's cool. cool. Well, cool. Bobby, thank you so much. I know that you 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 put me off as long as you could. <laughs> I did, man. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's totally good. <laughs> yeah, nothing to do with you. Uh, uh, yeah, I just freak out a little bit. On, on, you on, did a on, great on, job. Yeah. You did a great job. And I appreciate you taking the time, okay? All right, brother. All Thanks, right. man. Well, that's going to wrap up this edition of Delivering Marketing Joy. We'll see you next time.